Well, hi everyone. Uh, many of you told me you like to see more of these hands-on demonstrations of various types of foundation testing. So here we're at a project along an interstate. They have drilled shaft foundations going in to support signposts. And uh, the conventional way to test these is through cross-hole sonic logging. Unfortunately, this contractor keeps using these CSL access pipes that I do not recommend whatsoever. It's these thin wall uh, pipes made by applied foundation technologies. And they tend to rack and leak, and that's what happened here. So it was a three tube shaft. They had uh, enough bend in the pipes that we couldn't get our probes past the very first joint. So we were only able to do cross hole sonic logging for one combination. Now we're in a state where they like to apply deducts and we did the cross hole sonic logging for the one combination and everything turned out great. And given that this is a laterally loaded foundation, I think that would have been adequate. However, the DOT, without consulting me, just decided they wanted to do this uh, test called Sonic Echo Impulse Response as a supplement to the CSL. And they didn't talk to me about what their objectives were. Most drill shaft anomalies are at the very base of the shaft within the, say, bottom two or three feet. And that's really outside the accuracy of this test method. Usually you can get a shaft length determination within one diameter. And then you could have other factors like this shaft will have, <coughs> have a rock socket and you can have reflections off the bedrock contact, which will prevent you from resolving the full length of the shaft. Now we're seeing this more and more where DOTs rely on consultants in particular to perform specialty testing like, I, like we do at my company, which is great. But there's also a tendency nowadays for a lot of DOTs to not listen to the people that are really knowledgeable about this testing. I see this periodically, you know, especially in 20 year cycles. I've been doing this almost 40 years. So I've seen at least a couple of major turnovers with staff at these DOTs, which results in a, a loss of institutional knowledge. And you know, if from an ethical standpoint, I'm going to mention all the limitations of this test in my report. And so from an engineering standpoint, this test is absolutely worthless in this particular scenario. Now, it's gonna help the contractor because the DOT said that's what they wanted. Presumably, if we get any kind of result uh, that's favorable, even if it's just for a portion of the shaft, that'll allow them to continue, probably with a deduct on the price of the shaft, but they'll be able to move along. So again, because this is a laterally loaded foundation, I wouldn't be too worked up about the potential for a small anomaly on one side of the shaft anyway, but nobody's asking me here. So we're gonna do the test and help the contractor move along. So we're using a Sonic Echo Impulse Response System made by Olson Engineering. And it's an, a module on their Freedom PC that we use for cross hole sonic logging primarily. So you go through here, we're gonna leave pretty much out of the scene. So we're gonna hook up our stuff to channels three, four, and five. So you can see the icon Three is the hammer, four is the accelerometer, and five is the geophone. There's a check mark, so they're all active channels, and the orange highlight means we're gonna trigger on the hammer, okay? okay? So for most applications, we use the black tip. These plastic tips have different hardnesses, which affects the wavelength of the input compression wave when you hit the, the top of the shaft. So what you wanna do is we're gonna to to squat down and do a clean hit, like smack perpendicular. You know, we're not trying to win a prize at the carnival by just doing real crazy, but nice and like pop, okay? This is the accelerometer, it's pretty small. This is the geophone, and this is our instrumented hammer, three pound hammer with a force transducer. So what we're gonna do is do a blow at a time, and I can either accept or reject the blow. We're gonna do a series of three blows, but wait till I signal you. I'll whack it if things look good, <clears throat> hit the accept button up here. It's, it's, it's a green check. Okay. okay. If, if it's squirrely or if I tell you it's bad, it's a bad hit, then you hit reject. Okay. So the, the basis of this test is to measure the two-way travel time of the compression wave. So 
two-way travel time, we take, take the time, divided by two, that should be the one-way distance time. That, that should be the time to travel the actual length of the shaft instead of down and back. Now, if you have a large change in diameter, even over 10% change of impedance, that can cause a reflection. I got a big job in Utah years ago because the local consultant that was doing this test said all the shafts were 30 feet long. They were constructed to be 70 feet long. So one of the first things I asked him is, uh, do you have change in diameter? Do you have telescopic casing? And that's what it was. It's where the first change in diameter occurred at 30 feet. So they kicked the other company off and, and hired us. See the accept? Yeah. Okay, does it look good? Yeah. All right, you'll do another one here. Okay. What's the matter? Uh, let me look here. Uh, no, that's good. The, the peaks are impact. We good? Okay. All right, we're done. <laughs> I got. I put in a waste speed of twelve thousand. It's actually twelve thousand five hundred. So my just really quick pick here. I've got an overall length of 36.86. The actual measured length was around 39. If I adjust the wave speed, we'll be right on the money. So it's a good test. I'm gonna check that the file's saved before we pack up out of here. All right, so in post, I'll show you what the data reduction looks like. It's just too bright for the camera to pick up the screen right now. Okay, so here's what the Sonic Echo data plots look like. In the upper left hand corner we have our force transducer connected to the hammer. Then we have our geophone and accelerometer in the other two panels. And so what we want to do is we'll enter an input wave speed, in this case 12,500 feet per second, and that's based on common practice and the fact that we did cross hole sonic logging. We know that's pretty close to what it is throughout the length of the shaft. And then we'll just pick the two points, the first two points where there's major reversals in polarity and the program calculates the distance based on that wave speed. In this case it's 38.56 feet. Sometimes to resolve these, these are the individual traces plus the average. We can turn off individual traces and we can change the filter levels. In this case the filter is at 1000 hertz on a low pass filter. So in that way it's a rather trial and error process but it, often if you've got good quality data the results converge rather quickly. And this is what the data looks like in the frequency domain. In the upper right panel here we select the peaks and the program calculates distance is 37.2 feet. So those two values are, are pretty close. They're within the accuracy of the test method. Of course the overall shaft length is close to that as well. So it's a great test. So this is 42 inch diameter. Since it's over 30 inches, the ASTM says you're supposed to do multiple spots, like three spots, it's a waste of time. Uh, especially if you get good results at the center. If it's a much larger diameter shaft, you wanna grab that accelerometer, you can hit multiple points around the perimeter and even a few within the center. Climbing up this hill, it looks like shale bedrock. It's highly weathered, so we didn't get a reflection off the bedrock contact, which was nice. So in this case, we spent more time setting up and taking down than running the test. This test can go pretty quickly, but the post-processing can be very time consuming and tedious because you'll apply different filters. So primarily we're looking at the data in, in time domain, the two-way travel time. Since we used an instrumented hammer and uh, an accelerometer, a minimum one accelerometer, obviously, we're able to analyze the data in a frequency domain. It's good to be able to do that. Usually one or the other methods will yield uh, reasonable results. I had a shaft one time where they knew they had like a two foot diameter hole through this 
four foot diameter shaft about 10 feet from the top. And the local company did this test, but it showed a normal full length shaft, which was really weird. So they brought us in and I saw the same thing and still, uh, until I started playing around with the, the uh, frequency domain and then that anomaly stuck out very clearly. So you wanna have multiple analysis methods. There's a different manufacturer of this system out there and the software's kinda canned and a lot of people take the results at face value, which is a mistake. You know, it's good to have a, a strong geotechnical engineering background to do this work. I did this test one time for some driven pile that came up to a cap on our bridge. So it was basically like trestle pile. And this contractor was going to tear one bridge down and use the other as a work platform to, to, to build a new bridge. So I gave him a proposal. They are clear across the country. And then I get a call saying, ah, we decided to use this national company that has a local office. I'm like, okay, whatever. So then a week later, they call me and said, can you come here and test anyway? And uh, I said, let me guess, you got results that didn't make sense. He said, yes. So they sent me the report and the people writing the report reported pile links that corresponded to a link that was two feet below the mud line. So the mud line's the ground level, if you will, below a body of water. So this was in a river. So they had 10 feet of water, then the mud. And so the length they measured was from where they could see the top of the pile to two foot below the mud line. And obviously if that was true, the bridge wouldn't be standing up. So it helps to have some common sense in these situations. But this is a good test for what they call unknown foundations. It's not a great test for construction because obviously you can specify CSL, it's a much more accurate test. But uh, you know, for cell towers or typically installing new antenna. So some engineer has to go through there and check the structure and recalculate the ground line reactions to make sure the foundation's gonna be, be up to the additional loading. And uh, this, this was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but the uh, cell tower was 30 years old at that time and they had no as-built drawings or anything. So, I test it, this is a 300 foot tall, three-legged tower. And not only did it have the cell equipment on it, it also had all the emergency communication uh, equipment for that county. So I got out of our test and the, discovered that these four foot diameter shafts were only 15 feet long. And I couldn't believe it. I told them, you know, you've got foundations for light poles at, at a Walmart that are deeper than that. So, after that, they redoubled their efforts and found out, found the uh, geotech report and their drawings. And the plan was to install a bell shaft at the contact there with the bedrock. And of course, our testing indicated there was no belling at all. And that was a poor methodology to specify. I mean, Chicago's done a lot of bell shafts, but this wasn't in Chicago. So it was atypical construction to begin with. And as it turned out, they didn't do it right. So that was a very interesting application. Yeah, you spend more time winding these cables up than actually running the test. I always like to be at these jobs early. So in this case, I told them we'd be here by noon, which was correct. I actually got here at 10.30. So we'll probably be out of here before anybody shows up to get in our way. Which, you know, I don't mind talking to people and showing them what we're doing, but this is the kind of test you don't want to just spout out results. In fact, any kind of test, especially if I'm the one stamping the report. So all the date, all the results come through me after I've done the review in the office, even if I've been in the one, even if I'm the one that's been in the field. Well, did I cover everything? I think I did.